Welcome everyone back to The Real News Network. I'm Jared Ball here in Baltimore. For many nominal progressives, Bernie Sanders is the latest great white hope. But according to our next guest, Sanders is much more akin to the great white hype. The great white hype! That is, he is long on progressive rhetoric, but short on any history of actual progressive action, particularly when it comes to race. Paul Street now joins us to discuss his latest article appearing this month in Counterpunch, Why Bernie Sanders is No Great White Hope for Black America. Paul Street is an independent radical democratic policy researcher and author of many books, including Racial Oppression in the Global Metropolis. He can be found online at paulstreet.org. Welcome, Paul Street, to The Real News Network. Thank you very much, Jared. So, as you say in your piece, uh, Bernie Sanders is no great white hope for black America. Let's start there and have you explain your point. Well, well you know, first of all, uh, you know, as your viewers can see, I'm white. So it ultimately, it's, you know, the best spokes, spokes, spokespeople uh, on what the Sanders phenomena does mean or doesn't mean to the black community are going to come from within that community. Um, that said, um, I paid a lot of attention uh, to the rhetoric and the reality of the Sanders phenomena on numerous levels, and one of those is race. And of course, race is very much uh, in the headlines regarding Sanders lately because of the incident with Black Lives Matter movement that took place in uh, Seattle. There was an earlier one that took place in Phoenix where black activists uh, felt compelled, uh, I think for some good reasons. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about their tactics and how useful they were, but for some very good reasons to intervene uh, in the Sanders candidacy and, and uh, bring some issues to the forefront. And it's forced Sanders to uh, 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 think a little bit more and, and retrace his steps a little bit more on race. And he's got some retracing to do, and he's got some issues, and these go back a, a, a long way. And if you tr trace Sanders' history as a um, congressman, Back through the 1990s, you will find him uh, signing off on and voting for uh, a critical piece of legislation, Bill Clinton's 1994 Three Strikes uh, Crime Bill, uh, which, among other things, underwrote massive expansion of incarceration uh, 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 in this country, the funding of uh, prison construction, uh, and the consignment of uh, many, many uh, felons to lifetime imprisonment uh, for a third offense, any kind of third felony offense, including uh, drug offenses and other nonviolent offenses. And that, that's, that's a problem for someone uh, um, to, uh, about whom some white liberals and progressives are almost sort of lecturing black Americans, saying, what's your problem with this guy? This is your last great uh, hope. Sanders also, uh, as a senator, uh, backed, voted for uh, the No Child Left Behind Act, which, among other things, imposes this hideous drill and grill standardized uh, test-based sort of mind-numbing curriculum uh, nationwide, but with particular savagery um, and, and with horrible consequences on inner city black uh, public, public school districts. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more you can say. But, Paul, you know, we now see on his website he has a racial justice platform in which he addresses what he calls economic violence and state violence from the police, et cetera. Is there anything in his track record that suggests that any of these issues in particular have uh, been a focus of his during, throughout his career? Uh, well, there's a, there's a long history on economic justice with, with Bernie Sanders and, and, and about issues that would matter to, to black America in any, in, in any community in America that, that, like black America, has a disproportionate number of its people living, living in poverty. I mean, I want to be clear about that. Single-payer health insurance, uh, real progressive taxation, major federal jobs programs, a lot of that economic stuff that the whole working class, regardless of race, requires would matter uh, to, to poor working class black Americans. There's, there's, there's no debate about that. There's, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt uh, about that. Uh, on criminal justice, um, the record is not very strong for reasons I think I already indicated, in particular that three strikes bill that he voted for, which is just horrendous, and I have yet to hear any real public apologies for that. And, and Sanders has a long history of, um, of, of, of trying to forge strong relationships with police unions, police associations, speaking in terms of law and order. A lot of the language that, that, that 
uh, that that subtly beneath its colorblind sort of uh, surface and rhetoric is really about this lockdown that is very distinctive in, in America, where we have more than two, you know, it's unprecedented globally, it's unmatched globally, 2.4 million prisoners, uh, nearly two thirds of them. But you know, Paul, you, 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 you also address something else that I think is really important in this piece. And it's not just black voters who are potentially being scammed here in terms of uh, putting an overemphasis on Bernie Sanders as this, this great hope. Uh, you have a quote in here where you talk about the, the the impact that he has on the interpretation of the or, or the or people's interpretation of the vote as being uh, a potential uh, value of any kind in ad addressing all of these persistent problems that, that so many in this country still face. In fact, you, your quote here says that at the same time, uh, and, and this is a key point, there is a big difference between assisting a great grassroots struggle for social justice like the 1960s civil rights movement, which Bernie Sanders always claims that he was involved in, and running for the White House under the banner of the, of the corporate and imperial Democratic Party. The first form of activism is a worthy commitment. The second is not. It encourages encourages people to link their hopes for progressive change and social justice to a reactionary political party with a long and deserved history as the graveyard of social movements. It channels popular anger and excitement into a dead, money-soaked political and elections system, and its staggered quadrennial, highly personalized and mass-marketed corporate media mediated candidate-centered electoral spectacles, as if that's the real and only politics that matters. Could you speak to the point you're making here in terms of the potential for Bernie Sanders to have a negative impact on how many people, not just black Americans, feel about uh, struggle change in the vote itself? Yeah, this left criticism of the Sanders phenomenon sort of operates on two levels. And one of them is the policy specific and the limits of the policy from, from the limits of his policy agenda and policy history and his political history from, from, a, uh, from a left and progressive standpoint. You know, that, and that's one level. You know, and another big part of that level that needs to be mentioned is his failure to say anything substantive to challenge the Pentagon system and talk about the empire, uh, you know, which the, the Pentagon, which accounts for 54 percent of federal discretionary spending. And if he doesn't if he doesn't tackle that, um, you know, in a substantive kind of way, we're not going to be able to find the, the tax dollars and the funds to fund the anti-poverty programs that might benefit poor black America and poor working class America in general. That's one level is the policy level. The other level is even if he was better, even if he was further left, um, there's this kind of um, uh, misplaced priorities in terms of uh, that, that are encouraged amongst the populace in terms of how we should uh, focus our political energies. And, and we're supposed to all sort of pour it all into these uh, uh, major party, big money, uh, uh, um, 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 major media, candidate centered, quadrennial electoral extravaganzas. You know, which at the end of the day are dominated uh, uh, by big money and major parties that are dedicated to shutting down direct citizen action. We're supposed to consider that to be the only politics that really matters. Well, you know, I'm with Howard Zinn and with some things that Noam Chomsky has written and that other radicals and leftists have written, which is, you know, if voting uh, uh, makes you feel good, uh, you know, go ahead and by all means do it. If it, you know, if it makes you feel better, but it takes about two minutes. I'm in Iowa, we have the caucus, and the caucus takes about two hours. It takes about two hours, takes about two minutes. What really matters is what you do before and after those, those, um, those two hours and those two minutes. And there's a much more urgent and a much more significant um, kind of politics called social movements. And that's what's really brought about progressive change historically in this country. The industrial workers movement in the 30s, civil rights movement in the 60s, the anti-war movement in the 60s. Uh, in the 70s, we're going to get much better uh, results from them. And that's difficult work. Building those kinds of movements uh, are day-to-day, -day painstaking uh, activism that go on beneath the, and before and beyond these big uh, uh, candidate-centered electoral spectral, spectacles, uh, whatever their outcomes. And I've seen over and over again these presidential politics sort of suck up all that energy. I see that particularly in Iowa, where we're basically now, we are in full quadrennial presidential election mode, and everything is about these candidates all the time. We're all in Iowa, just supposed to run around and go to all these candidate events as if that's all that, that politics is about. And really, voting is a very small uh, part of the, of, of the politics that really matters. And Dr. King, for example, understood that very well in the mid-1960s, near the end of his life, when progressives approached him 
and, and, and tried to get him to run as an anti-war, civil rights, anti-poverty presidential candidate in 1968. And, and King wanted nothing whatsoever to do with that because he knew, um, A, he couldn't win, and B, even if he thought he could, he would be sending people down the wrong direction in terms of where to focus their energies. We will not build lasting organizations, lasting movements um, by trusting in and trumpeting and looking up to candidates uh, like they're they're say like they're they're going to save us. And that's Paul Street. Yeah. Paul Street, thank you very much for joining us here at the Real News. We appreciate your analysis, and we look forward to having you back again before too long. Thank you for joining us. You bet. And thank you for joining us here at The Real News. For all involved, I'm Jared Ball again here in Baltimore. And as always, as Fred Hampton used to say, to you we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. Peace, everybody, and we'll catch you in the whirlwind.